Hey folks, Tony Gatliff here with more Military Resource Radio. They say third time's a charm, and this is our third episode with filmmaker Michael Epstein. Just an amazing guy. He's got uh, two uh, current films out. Uh, One is Going to War, premiered on Memorial Day on PBS, and uh, probably available, I think, at pbs.org by now. Uh, But if not, you know, do a search, Going to War. It's an absolutely amazing uh, program. Uh, And as well, House 2. Uh, which we're going to talk a little bit more about today. Uh, that just premiered at Tribeca, and that's a tremendously controversial, but a, uh, a great, great film, very well put together, and I think you want to hear a little bit more about it today. We're also going to talk uh, today on Military Resource Radio about a, uh, a death of a veteran who was involved in a, a very scandalous situation over in Vietnam. We're also going to talk about a World War II veteran who just got his high school school diploma at age 94, uh, tremendous, and a World War II veteran who's looking for 100 cards for his 100th birthday. So a couple of uplifting stories here at the end of the show today. Uh, Again, I'm Tony Gatliff, uh, your host for Military Resource Radio. Again, for all the latest and greatest information, head on over to militaryresourceradio.com and please follow us on Twitter at Military RR. That's at the word military, Romeo, Romeo. Again, I'm Tony Gatliff, your host for Military Resource Radio. And uh, without uh, uh, further uh, talking here on my part, because I know you folks, you, you listen to me enough here on Military Resource Radio. I know that you're going to really enjoy hearing my talk with Michael Epstein. So let's get right into that. Again, militaryresourceradio.com and follow us on Twitter at Military RR. We'll see you on the flip side of this break. The last question about this particular film that I wanted to ask, right, was Frank Wooderich, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it's it was interesting the way that... Uh, you know, he basically said, you know, I'm not sure what happened. I don't remember exactly what happened because obviously it's a chaotic situation. This situation and the the court martial and everything went on for six and a half years, right? And I think one thing that made him sort of look guilty, right, was him saying, well, I can't remember, Right. And, yeah, for and, sure. Look, and, I mean, the government said he walked into a room full of women and children and shot everybody. And when his own lawyers would say what happened, his response to all of us for years was, I can't remember. And, you know, for all of us, that just was unbelievable. How can you possibly not remember? Um, are you suppressing it? Are you withholding? And ultimately, you know, what the film shows is he could remember. Um, but he was unwilling, he was unwilling to throw his own Marines under the bus, even to his own attorneys, for fear that his own lawyers would use that knowledge against them. So, so, Uh, so here's a weird thing, right? And I'm going to ask you this question. Do you think in your heart of hearts that Frank Wooderich did anything wrong and do you think he had a part in that in your heart of hearts not saying can it be proven can it not be proven i mean it's all over now right so nothing's going to happen it's a good question i do not believe frank wooderich committed any murders or frankly for that matter uh because not all the deaths that day as often as in combat were murder um i do not think frank wooderich killed anybody in haditha on 19 november 2005 uh, at all. I think Frank is guilty at least of what he pled guilty to, which was negligent dereliction of duty. Where I struggle uh, is whether it was willful dereliction of duty. And that's the difference between a, um, a misdemeanor and a felony. And I have to be honest with you, uh, I like Frank. I think Frank is uh, he's an exceptional father. You know, he has sole custody of his three little girls still to this day. Um, I was with him for over a decade. And, you know, the story, the narrative effectively put forward by the government and by time and the rest of the press was that in the aftermath of that IED, Frank went on a rampage, a murderous, angry rampage. And 
uh, you know, as you can see in the film, he, 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 one of his problems was that he had the, he was not capable of expressing emotion, uh, which became a big problem in trying to, that I didn't try to defend it, but his team tried to defend him. Um, you know, I, I'd say, you know, you can judge me because I was inside and say, oh, well, you know, Stockholm Syndrome, he was sure. so close, yeah, all that stuff. But I would tell you honestly that n not only do I not think, not only is there no forensic evidence to support it, but the NCIS came to that same conclusion, that Frank was innocent. And they came to that conclusion after working with me because the government withheld key witness testimony and key evidence from them. The government shut down protocols that had been approved and funded that would have given them better forensic answers for fear of what those answers might be. Um, but look, Frank has command responsibility. He was the non-commissioned officer on the scene that day. And he had said to me, he, he finally saw the film. He said, you know, he doesn't disagree with his fate because um, he was in charge and what happened shouldn't have happened and that makes it his responsibility. Um, and I'm look, Frank's the only Marine still, the only Marine, officer and or otherwise, who's taken responsibility for civilian deaths that should not have happened. Um, and to me, that just, it's all you need to know about Frank Witterich. Um, I think very highly of Frank. Um, and, and I say that thinking that that event that day ended up actually being murder as well. Hey folks, Tony Gatliff, host of Military Resource Radio here. And a question I get all the time about Military Resource Radio is, Tony, where can I listen to Military Resource Radio? Well, we are on several different online outlets that you can get on your favorite device. We are on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Google Play, Player FM, iHeartRadio, and TuneIn, which is already pre-programmed into your Amazon Echo device. All you need to do is go up to that Echo device and say, Alexa, play Military Resource Radio podcast. Boom. Instantly. The most recent episode of Military Resource Radio will start playing on your Amazon Echo device. Whether that's a spot, a show, the regular Echo, whatever it is, you can get Military Resource Radio anytime, any place through Amazon on that. And as well, again, folks, those online outlets where you can download, subscribe to, and rate Military Resource Radio five stars are as follows iTunes, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Google Play, Player FM, iHeartRadio, and TuneIn. And folks, another place that you can uh, grab Military Resource Radio digitally is through our website at militaryresourceradio.com. Not only can you get uh, all available episodes of the show, a preview of our next show, and as well as some other features, this is where all the latest and greatest information about Military Resource Radio uh, is uh, given out. Uh, you can take a look at our podcast tab where you, you can see each and every uh, previous episode of the show right there and available for play right at militaryresourceradio.com. You can click the About Us tab, take a look at a little bit more information about me, Tony Gatliff, your host of Military Resource Radio, and about the show itself. You can contact us uh, through our online contact form, or you can simply call us at 888-366, the number four in the letters MRR, that's Mike Romeo Romeo. Numerically, that's 888-366-4677. You can contact us either via email or via phone. Um, and uh, as well, uh, you can take a look again at militaryresourceradio.com. That's our home base for all the latest and greatest information. Uh, you can check out where to listen to us, the links for the aforementioned iTunes, SoundCloud, Spreaker, TuneIn, Player FM, Google Play, iHeartRadio. They're all right there on our website, so you can go to whichever outlet you like the best 
download uh, right into your device and subscribe to our podcast and rate it five stars. Folks, you have no uh, idea how much that helps here with Military Resource Radio. So, again, I'm Tony Gatliff, your host of Military Resource Radio. Please don't hesitate to head on over to militaryresourceradio.com and contact us through our contact form or uh, just take a look at some of the great information on the show. Or if you want to, give us a call. We do respond to all voicemails and messages left. Again, that number is 888-366, the number four in the letters MRR, or 888-366-4677 digitally. I'm Tony Gatliff, your host with Military Resource Radio. Now, back to more Military Resource Radio. Hey folks, Tony Gatliff back with another segment of Military Resource Radio. We're going to get back to our final portion of our uh, interview here with Michael Epstein. God, that guy's been great. He's been on the last three episodes and uh, he's just awesome. We've gleaned so much awesome information from him. Just a great guy and was very generous with his time. And uh, we will get back to our final portion of the interview with him in just a minute. But Um, Something that caught my eye, just a little uh, news story here that was sort of apropos of what we're talking about here with Michael Epstein's uh, film House 2. Um, Not exactly the same situation, but uh, something that kind of reminded me of House 2. And this is off of uh, the Associated Press. uh, And this is uh, Associated Press from uh, May 14th. Um, And uh, as I'm recording this, uh, it's about three days ago. Ernest Medina, key figure in My Lai Massacre, dies at 81 years old. And I'm going to talk about this here. Uh, So former Army Captain Ernest L. Medina, a key figure in the My Lai Massacre during the Vietnam War, has died in Wisconsin. He was 81. Medina was an Army Captain on March 16th, 1968, when American troops under his command killed hundreds of unarmed Vietnamese civilians. He was acquitted in a court-martial over the massacre. Medina died May 8th, according to an obituary written by his family. No cause of death was given. He was being buried the following Monday. Medina was a captain of Charlie Company, whose mission was to attack a crack Viet Cong unit. The intelligence soldiers received was inaccurate and they encountered no resistance in the village of Mai Lai and a neighboring community. Charlie Company killed 504 villagers in just three to four hours, most of them women, children, and elderly men. It wasn't until more than a year later that the news of the massacre became public. Medina was accused of responsibility in the deaths of at least 182 civilians. Medina, whose platoon took up a position in reserve outside the village, said during his trial that he was not with the soldiers when the massacre happened and that he didn't know about it until it was over. Medina acknowledged killing one woman but said he believed she was about to attack him. Lieutenant William Calley Jr., who led the first platoon into my lie, was the only one convicted of the 25 men originally charged in the massacre. In a 1988 interview with the Associated Press, Medina looked back on my lie as a horrendous thing that never should have happened. I have regrets for it, but I have no guilt over it because I didn't cause it, he said. That's not what the military, particularly particularly the United States Army, is trained for. But then again, maybe the war should never have happened. I think if everybody were to look at it in hindsight, I'm sure a lot of the politicians and generals would think of it otherwise. Maybe it was a war that we should have probably never gotten involved in as deeply as we did without the will to win it. Medina earned a silver star for bravery for actions he took, saving the lives of fellow soldiers during a battle shortly before My Lai. Although Medina was acquitted of murder and manslaughter for the My Lai killings, his 16-and-a-half-year Army career was ruined and he resigned his commission. He moved with his wife and three children to Marinette, Wisconsin in 1971. He worked as a salesman for a helicopter helicopter manufacturer for a while and later went into real estate. Medina was born in Springer, New Mexico to Simon and Pauline Medina. Medina's mother died shortly after his birth and his grandparents raised him in Montrose, Colorado, according to his family's obituary. Medina lied about his age to join the Colorado National Guard at 16, his family said. 
1956, he enlisted in the Army after briefly considering joining the seminary. Then, while stationed in Heilbronn, Germany, he met the woman he would eventually marry, Bearbell de Chant. He quickly fell in love and declined an offer to take an exam to go to West Point Military Academy so that he could marry his soulmate. His obituary reads, Ernie, as his family called him in the obituary, craved time with family, friends, and working in the community. He also enjoyed having an occasional cigar, a good home brew, trying to fill his endless garage with assorted collectibles, and dreaming of restoring an antique Ford Model T and a 1960s VW Bug, his obituary reads. According to the obituary, Medina is survived by his wife, daughter Ingrid Medina, sons Greg and Cecil Medina, eight grandchildren, and his cousin, Erklika Salamoni. So, anyways, uh, interesting, interesting stuff, and kind of did remind me of what we were talking about a little bit with House 2 here with filmmaker Michael Epstein. Uh, again, um, you know, certainly a man who was a veteran, a controversial figure, obviously. Uh, you know, a terrible, terrible thing happened under his command, um, and uh, an interesting story uh, in. Uh, sinking in with house two a little bit so anyway just wanted to mention that again i'm tony gatliff with military resource radio please go to militaryresourceradio.com for all the latest and greatest information on the show and as well we'll be back uh, in just a minute here with another segment with uh, filmmaker michael epstein we'll talk to you on the flip side Hey folks, Tony Gatliff here, host of Military Resource Radio. While we have a minute here, I wanted to mention our mission statement here on Military Resource Radio, and that is as follows. Here on Military Resource Radio, we connect veterans and active duty service members with amazing resources and organizations to improve their lives. We inspire veterans, active duty service members, and civilians alike to get involved with these amazing resources and organizations. We also enlighten veterans, active duty service members, and and civilians alike on service-related resources and benefits like the real estate and mortgage market and process, as well as other current military news and events related to them. Uh, in addition, folks, we always like to, on Military Resource Radio, we like to send out a hearty thank you to all our veterans and active duty service members around the world and coast to coast. Thank you so much for what you've done. Thank you so much for what you continue to do. That's what makes uh, America the land of the free and the home of the brave and what uh, keeps us uh, doing military resource radio every single week. So thank you so much to all our active duty service members and veterans coast to coast and around the world. We really appreciate it. Now, back to more military resource radio. Here's another theory, and this is just what I sort of thought thinking about it sure do, do you think there's any possibility that maybe they were all in on it together and maybe the lies and the contradictions and everything was sort of a planned like kind of an i am spartacus thing like if we all mm -hmm. say that the other one is guilty they right. won't be able to ring any of us up that was just something uh, that I, I had an idea or i just had a thought of i guess you know I, I think afterwards there was some collusion after the event, but not really at the time. Look, I mean, one of the things that we don't dive too deep into in the film is they entered House 2 and they they fragged the washroom upon entry. The washroom was empty. It was completely empty. And the first grenade did not go off, and they had to refrag the washroom. And that's when Mendoza ran down the hallway with that completely insane story that he gives in the film about yeah which which i could just tell that was bs just by the way he was talking you know you could just tell yeah. people are lying he's not a very good liar right but the key for me was always that washroom which is why are you fragging a room twice if you're on a rampage uh, an empty room a room where you're you know you, you're not fragging a room first of all uh that has nobody in it if you're on a rampage it's a terrible way to kill civilians um, and you're doing it twice. You're doing it because you think there's a threat in there. You're doing it because, you know, you're following your training. You're, you're mount training in this instance. You throw a grenade low and hard, and you follow along with fire. And it, the room was empty. And yet, literally down the hallway, just 10 yards down that hallway, is a room 
only with civilians, with six children and two women, who somebody walks in, sits at the foot of the bed, mm-hmm. and and shoots everybody. And then, according to the witness, sticks his M4 under the bed uh, to to then try and shoot children who are hiding under the bed. Right? That's not a combat action, and that the, no marine or soldier is trained to do that anywhere under any army in the world, right? I mean, that is a war crime. And so something happened in that 10 yards between the bathroom and the door. And I think that, I personally think, as does the NCIS, that when Mendoza opened the door, he testified this, he testified that he just saw that there were women and children, they closed the door. The surviving witness in that room said that that Marine, the Marine who opened the door the first time, threw a grenade in, but that a grenade didn't go off because it was taped. And I think that she's right. I mean, I believe Safa. And I think what ended up happening was that then, you know, somebody opened the door. Um, According to Safa, the same Marine who threw the grenade was waiting in the kitchen. When her aunt opened the door, he shot her, and then he walked into the room and shot everybody. And um, I think after that, the fever broke. And um, Frank told us that another Marine then went back in with his 9mm Beretta and emptied a magazine. To, and I think to make sure that everybody was dead. Um, to and dead men you know, tell, that's a no, very tell difficult no tales, story. that type of thing. That's right. And that's a very difficult story. You know, that's a painful story for all of us. And the easiest thing to do when you are presented, and that's the forensics. I mean, that's the NCIS narrative after the trial ended. I mean, we pieced it all together with the witness testimony and the photographs and their own stuff and, and, and everything. You know, the simplest thing for all of us to do is to say, oh, well, it's just one rogue Marine or one rogue soldier, um, instead of, you know, the way we train or the Marine Corps or, or us, you and me. Um, it's so much easier to, to blame Frank Wooderich. Uh, that's literally what a scapegoat is, right? To take our sins. Sure. And Apply him on someone else. And put him on someone else and then sacrifice him. Um, And I think we did that, all of us. Because, look, you know, when I started to work on that project, that film, um, Neil was being inundated by media requests. And the media was every day. It was in the New York Times. It was in the Washington Post. It was leading the evening news, a 24-hour news cycle. By the time we got to Frank's court-martial, no one showed up. Time Magazine didn't send a reporter, the New York Times didn't send a reporter, the Wall Street Journal didn't send a reporter, and after they gave Frank a plea deal, there was a press conference, and now you see it in the film, the room is practically empty. Um, and, And then, honestly, you know, I've had an impossible time finding a distributor for this film. Um, and I, you know, the indifference is pretty overwhelming and 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 i i think we are all complicit in this cover-up i think it would be a mistake to just say it was the marine prosecutors or marine leadership um we just didn't allow this to happen we actively turned away from it and we still are um and it's so much easier to say you know this one marine staff sergeant is responsible um then really looking at what happened and, and, and holding ourselves accountable. A- absolutely. And uh, folks, for more, you've got to see this film, House 2, uh, and also, again, Going to War, uh, which is premiering on Memorial Day on PBS. Uh, Michael Epstein, producer, writer, director. Uh, it has been very informative and uh, a very deep dive. We've went over a lot of this, but you really have to see these films in order to really appreciate them. And uh, 
It is so appreciative. Uh, we are so appreciative to have had you on Military Resource Radio and uh, getting a, these stories out there. I had a great time, and it was um, it was a very thoughtful conversation, and it was just great. And so, thank you uh, for the for this, and thank you for Military Resource Radio and everything you do. Um, uh, it's it's great it's great work you do. So, thanks for everything, and thank you very much for having me. Absolutely, anytime. Hey folks, Tony Gatliff, host of Military Resource Radio here, and I'm sorry to interrupt this rousing rendition of Military Resource Radio, but I've got a couple things I've got to go over. The first thing is Military Resource Radio is on the BBMC Mortgage Radio Network, and it is sponsored by BBMC Mortgage. BBMC Mortgage is a full-service lender in all 50 states doing residential purchase and residential refinance loans. Any of your residential mortgage needs can be taken care of by BBMC Mortgage. And if you do have any needs, you need to dial us up at 888-366, the number 4, and the letters MRR. That's 888-366, the number 4, Mike Romeo Romeo. Or, numerically, 888-366-4677. We will put you in touch with the right expert at BBMC Mortgage to handle your situation You'll be so glad that you got your mortgage through BBMC Mortgage because they are a tremendous sponsor of this show. And guess what? Me, Tony Gatliff, I'm a vice president of mortgage lending at BBMC Mortgage too, in addition to being the host of this show. So we'll put you in touch with the right person here at BBMC Mortgage. If you do have any mortgage needs, please give us a call, 888-366, the number four, and the letters MRR. As well... If you do choose to do business with BBMC Mortgage, you're doing well and you're doing good at the same time. And that's because of our Patriots Charity Initiative. This is an amazing program, folks. What it does is BBMC Mortgage on each and every funded loan's proceeds, whether that's a VA loan, FHA loan, conventional loan, non-conforming or jumbo loan, any mortgage that we do, whether it's a purchase or refinance, we give $125 of that funded loans proceeds, which adds up to about over $2.5 million since 2015 when we started this. We give $125 of that funded loans proceeds to one of four veteran-related service organizations. Now, it's BBMC's $125, but you, the client, get to pick where it goes. And the four veteran service organizations that we work with right now on the Patriots Charity Initiative are the USO, the Mission Continues, the Headstrong Project, and Team Rubicon, all amazing organizations. You can find out more about our Patriots Charity Initiative by heading on over to militaryresourceradio.com. Again, that's militaryresourceradio.com for all the latest and greatest information on the show. But you have to scroll down on the homepage down to our Patriots Charity Initiative section, and that'll give you a better idea of what we do and what these service organizations out there do. They're All four of them are amazing organizations that are doing great things for veterans and active duty service members out there, so I'm sure you're going to want to check that out. One last thing. I want you to follow us on Twitter at MilitaryRR. That's at Military, just the word Military, Romeo, Romeo, at MilitaryRR. That's our Twitter handle for Military Resource Radio. We're just getting that up and running, so please jump onto Twitter and follow us at MilitaryRR. Again, I'm Tony Gatliff, your host with Military Resource Radio, and we'll be back in just a minute with some more Military Resource Radio. Hi folks, Tony Gatliff here again with more Military Resource Radio. Wanted to uh, mention to everyone how thankful I was to have filmmaker Michael Epstein here uh, on Military Resource Radio. He just was a tremendous guest, was very, very, very generous with his time, and uh, truly something that uh, we were very happy to have him uh, on the show. He was just great. And uh, so our interview with him is concluded. We look forward to having Michael on at some other point. I had a couple news stories that I wanted to uh, talk about here to uh, round out the podcast today. Um, And the first one involves a World War II veteran, 94 years of age, who's going to finally earn his high school diploma. This is off Fox News. 
Um, and this is about Roland Martineau, a 94-year-old World War II veteran getting his high school diploma. About seven decades after he dropped out of high school, a 94-year-old World War II veteran will walk the stage of Leo Minster High School in Massachusetts to finally receive his diploma. Roland Martineau, a Navy veteran from Leo Minster, Massachusetts, never finished high school. His mother died when he was six, and his father split soon afterward. Martineau's grandparents could not afford to keep sending him to school, so he dropped out and joined the workforce. He got married and then joined the Navy, serving in the Pacific. We went looking for trouble. We found it. He, he joked to Boston 25 recently, and we took care of it. When he returned from war, Martineau became a welder. He wanted to finish school, but did not have the opportunity to do so. The decorated CB went on to live a long life. He has four sons, 17 grandchildren, 14 great-grandchildren, and a great-great-grandchild on the way. He recently told his longtime barber, Donna Salvi, that never getting his diploma was his biggest regret. He's just an easy person to love. He reminds me of my father, who would have been about his age right now, she told Boston 25. Salvi and her boyfriend, Leo Minster firefighter Bobby Penning, made it their mission to help him achieve his dream. I went to the vets, the Veterans Center of Leo Minster, and then I went to the mayor's office, and then I went to the school department, Penning said. It was going to be a surprise, but a bout of pneumonia in which Martineau felt he was not going to leave the hospital changed plans. We said, Pepe, you have a really big surprise coming up. You have to hang on, Wendy Albert, Martineau's granddaughter, told Boston 25. Martineau's health soon improved. On June 2nd, Martineau will finally receive his high school diploma nearly 70 years in the making. He says, I can't wait to get my hair cut the day before graduation, <laughs> Salvi said. Interesting story. Well, congratulations to you uh, out there. Roland Martineau, 94 years old, finally earning your high school diploma. That is awesome. Great story. We here at Military Resource Radio salute you. As well, I wanted to talk about this article. This is also off Fox News. And this is a, right here in my home state of Michigan. Michigan World War II veteran hopes to receive 100 cards on his 100th birthday. For his 100th birthday on June 6, which comes 74 years after he was miraculously pulled off a Normandy-bound boat on D-Day, Michigan World War II veteran Isaac Ike Fabella has just one wish, his family said. Fabella will be anxiously checking his mail as the happy and humble veteran hopes to rack up 100 birthday cards from well-wishers across the country. And this is his 100th birthday, folks. This is on June 6th. Uh, he's always been that uncle that whenever you see him puts a smile on your face. Ike's great nephew, Nick Rogers, told Fox News on Wednesday. He's a very humble man. He says he has everything he needs already. Still, Ike's family hopes the veteran can commemorate his 100 years with 100 cards. My guess, and this is just a Tony sidebar, he's going to get a lot more than 100 cards. Ike, born in Texas in 1918, served from World War II from 1944 to 1946. His service took him to countries such as Germany and Norway. He nearly saw combat duty on D-Day on June 6, 1944, which also happened to be his 26th birthday. But he was pulled off a boat heading to the Normandy shore at the last minute, one of his eight daughters lowly told Fox News on Wednesday. When someone calls him a hero, it touches his heart, but he doesn't feel like he deserves that title. He always says that the young men who didn't make it back are the real heroes, Lowly said. It's amazing the things he remembers, the story he can tell. He's like a walking history book, she added. Ike has lived in Montrose for the majority of his life and is highly respected in the community, Lowly said. She recalls various instances of strangers approaching her father, thanking him for his countless acts of charity. For instance, Lily said a man once came up to her father, thanking him for buying his ticket to a local circus as a child because his family couldn't afford it. We had no idea he had done all of these things, she said. Rogers also commented on his great uncle's selflessness. His favorite memory with Ike, he said, was after he returned home from the Iraq War in 2006. The two had a long talk about their respective experiences in the military. Even though things were different, the thought process is the same. It was neat to tie our two hardships together. It's something that I'll never forget, said Rogers. 
Loli said her father is so excited for his birthday, adding that the majority of Montrose will take part in various planned celebrations. He's a very humble man and says he's never done anything to deserve all this, she said, but he has. Folks, if you'd like to send a birthday card, might even get there a little late now, but please feel free. You can mail it to Ike, I-K-E, Fabella, F-A-B-E-L-A, care of Nick Rogers, R-O-D-G-E-R-S, that's P.O. Box 3112, Montrose, Michigan, 48457. And I hope some of our listeners here on Military Resource Radio take the time to send Ike a birthday card. I know I'm going to as soon as I get done with this recording. He certainly, certainly, certainly deserves it. And uh, Ike, I wish you a happy 100th birthday. Thank you so much for doing uh, everything that you did. And I know you don't consider yourself a hero, but you're a hero to me. And I'm sure you're a hero to a lot of these people that are uh, listening to Military Resource Radio as well. That's going to be all for Military Resource Radio today. Uh, I am Tony Gatliff, uh, your uh, host of Military Resource Radio. Please head to militaryresourceradio.com for all the latest and greatest information on the show. And follow us on Twitter at MilitaryRR. That's at the word military, Romeo, Romeo on Twitter. Again, I'm Tony Gatliff, your host for Military Resource Radio. We will talk to you next week with another great episode of Military Resource Radio. 